So our topic tonight, Simchat Torah, not under the law, but under grace. What does that exactly does that mean? What does it mean to not to be under the law, to be under grace? There's a lot of misunderstandings regarding these simple words, but as we understand them, these simple words will become very powerful words and very meaningful words. So it's from the text in Galatians chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? And then from Romans 6, verse 11, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, in the full context of the Romans 6, verse 11, it says, Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Do not let sin reign over your mortal body. Don't give yourself to unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. And so in the context, I think it helps us quite a bit, and we'll come back to this uh, a little bit later on as we talk about some other things about the law. But uh, but in the greater context, gives a much more meaning to it than just the phrase that's often just used, not under the law, but under grace. We see already some things here. It has a lot to do with sin, right? Even verse 11, to be dead indeed to sin. That's really the issue. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, right? And so instead of being in, in, in being dead to sin, not allowing sin to reign, we allow God to make us alive from the dead and thus instruments of his righteousness. And that's some of the key there. And like anything else, reading the Bible, understanding the Bible, we've got to start with in context. What does it say around the text? And that's going to help us quite a bit here. So some of the places in the Bible, the same author, same book, Romans chapter 7, verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Now it's very interesting here, the next chapter, chapter 7, talks about the law being holy, just and good, and yet some people look at that text in verse six, chapter 6, that we're not under the law, thus the law is bad, get rid of the law, the law is done away with, forget about the law, it's the law that is oppressive, and so we remove the law because it is bad, and then we insert grace. That's how it's generally taught, generally understood, and it's totally wrong, especially as we just go on to the next, well, in context of what we saw before and after, and then what we see here, the very next chapter, where the law is good. The law is just. The law is holy. If it's good, no good thing will God withhold from them that walk uprightly. So why would he get rid of it if it's good? Why would he withhold it from us if it is good? And he himself, Paul, Rabbi Paul, said it is good and it's holy and it is just. So obviously we don't want to get rid of the law. So what does it mean then to not be under the law? We'll come back to that. Now let's look in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. Starting in verse 1, which is labeled as Aleph. Blessed, happy are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law, Torah, of the Lord. Blessed, happy are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Well, does that sound like a bad thing? Does it sound like it's oppressive to have the law? It says, happy are those who walk in the law. And so it doesn't sound like walking under the law in the law is being under it and being oppressed by it. It makes you happy and blessed. And in verse 9, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Open my eyes that I might see wonderful things from your law. 
It's wonderful. Wonderful things in it. It's holy. It's just. It's good. It keeps me from sinning that I might not sin against you. And that's what we saw in those verses. Not let sin reign over you. Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the paths of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Do those verses sound like it's impossible to keep God's law? Give me understanding. I observe it with my whole heart. I shall keep your law. Is that just wishful thinking? Was David just hoping and just writing this very poetically? And then we have to wait until Rabbi Paul comes along and says, oh, well, we can't keep it, so God did away with it? We were under it, and so he just takes it away and replaces it with grace instead? Is Paul in opposition to David? Oh, God forbid! <laughs> no, the law is good, it's holy, it's just, keeps us from sinning. Gives us understanding, gives us wisdom, gives us enlightenment. Blessed, happy, who keep your law to delight. Let your mercies come to me also, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. Your word has given me life. The proud have given me great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coin, uh, coins of gold and silver. Done away with? Gotten rid of? Better than gold and silver? Delight gives life, gives salvation. Won't turn aside. I love your law. It is my meditation all day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies. For they're ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Right? And there's that symbolism. It's sweet to my taste. Right? Tasting. The word of God, the law of God is sweet to our taste in our mouth. Like honey, better than honey, sweeter than honey. I love your law. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. I love your law. Now, was David being oppressed by the law, that he had this dysfunctional relationship? Was he codependent on the law? The law was abusive to him, and he was crushing him down, and he's under the law, and yet he loves this thing that's crushing him and is abusive to him? Oh. But that's the only conclusion we can come to if we're also believing that the law has been done away, that we can't keep the law, that it was given basically by mistake, Ten was too many. God had to lower it down to just two. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, than fine gold. Rivers of water run down from my eyes because men don't keep your law. David is heartbroken because people are not keeping God's law. It calls for God to act because they regarded your law as void. And that is exactly what is happening by those who teach that being under the law is, no, is, is that Ten Commandments are bad. We don't want the Ten Commandments. They've been done away with. They've been nailed to the cross. They're gone. <clears throat> your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. 
Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. I long for your salvation, O Lord. Your law is my delight. In Luke chapter 16, verse 17, quoting Yeshua, it is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of the pen to drop from the law. You think Yeshua said that when he was getting ready to get rid of it? When he was getting ready to do away with it? That something he gave for 4,000 years became obsolete? Came old fashioned, was a failed experiment. They needed to come and find something better to replace it with. No. Easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of the law. And you saw the strokes of the pen in the Torah. Ephesians 2. So in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. I said, by grace we're saved. So through faith. So is grace just as forgiveness? Or we're just forgiven? The law is there, but, but we broke the law and we continue to break the law and so we're just saved by grace, we're just saved by this forgiveness, just this nebulous forgiveness, just this open forgiveness that just forget about the sins, doesn't matter, price has been paid, just continue on it, to try and do better if you can, but if you can't, don't worry about it, the forgiveness is there. Is that what this is teaching here? Is that the kind of salvation it's talking about by saved by grace? No, but it's very true. We are saved by grace. And it's not by ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We can't, by keeping the law, earn salvation. No, God's salvation is a gift of God. His grace is a gift of God. But what is this grace? Is this grace just this kind of, again, wishy-washy, nothing forgiveness? No, much more than that. And the text continues on, although that's where many people stop. But they should read the next verse in context. Anyone know what the next verse says? How many have ever heard this verse before? Probably, grace, you have been saved through faith. Okay. How many know the next verse? We should know the next verse just as much as we know this verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Yeshua the Messiah for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What good works did God prepare beforehand? The law. He prepared it long beforehand. From the very beginning, his good works were there. From the very beginning, God's law has been there. Long before he wrote it on stone, it's just when he wrote it down for us. But it's always been there from the very beginning. So he saves us by his grace, which is not from ourselves, nothing that we can do to earn it, nothing that we can do to procure it, no way to obtain it except through faith. And that grace that saves us gives us the power to do the good works that God created us to do. That he prepared beforehand so that we can walk therein and delight in God's word and love his law and walk in them. Romans 4 verse 15, where there is no law, there is no transgression. This is in verse 4, again back to the original book of the Romans there. Romans 4, where there's no law, there's no transgression. Right? That makes sense. If there's no law, you can't fault someone 
for doing something that you didn't tell them is wrong. Right? If there's no rules, in Germany they got a road called the Autobahn that has no speed limit on it. Since there's no speed limit on it, can you get a speeding ticket? No. <laughs> Now you're allowed to go as fast as you want on that road. I've driven on that road. Now, I wasn't driving. I wish I was. <laughs> but you can go as fast as there's points of it. No speed limit. At least that's how it was. I don't, maybe it's still that set the way. So you can't get a speeding ticket if there's no law against speeding. Correct? And so where there's no law, there's no transgression. There's no sin. So if God was able to just do away with the law, then there'd be no sin. Right? It doesn't mean that people wouldn't do horrible things. It doesn't mean that people wouldn't kill each other, but just there'd be no accountability for it. It'd be like living in New York City. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> or California or other places. There's just no law against it. <laughs> And there's a law against it in New York City. They just don't enforce it if you're certain people. But whatever, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but if there's no law, it doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. It just means they can't hold them accountable for it. And so if there is no law, if God is able to say after 4,000 years, you know, I decided this law is not such a good thing. Let's do away with it. Let's stop it and just replace it with grace. Just replace it with this forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness type of concept of grace. Then if there's no sin, and there's no transgression, then there would have been no need for a Messiah to come and save us. There'd be no need for the Messiah to die for our sins if all God needed to do was say no more law. No more law, no more transgression. No more punishment, then no more need for a payment. No more need for a substitute. No more need for a death. And that would make his death in vain. And that is a horrible thought. But that really is the end result of teaching the law has been done away. The law is not necessary anymore. So what is the purpose of the law? The law is a mirror for us to show us right from wrong. And so if you look in a mirror <laughs> and you see that you have dirt on your face, what should you do? Do you take the mirror and rub it on the dirt? Will that get rid of the dirt? Will I get rid of the stain? Will I get rid of the smudge, the mud? No. That's not the purpose of the mirror. The mirror cannot remove dirt. The law cannot remove sin. The law can only point out sin and show us right from wrong. And so you wouldn't take the mirror either and throw it down and break it, would you? Would that solve the problem? You'd still have dirt on your face, wouldn't you? <laughs> wouldn't be too good for the mirror, right? But it wouldn't do too good for you. Wouldn't cleanse your face. So if the law is just done away with, we don't need the law anymore. We just do away with the law. And it's like breaking the mirror. And we still get dirt on our face. We still continue in sin. We still continue in wrong. And so, obviously that's not the thing to do. To get rid of the law. To get rid of the mirror. No, when we use the mirror and see that we have dirt on our face, we then go to the sink and to the water and to the soap to cleanse our face. So the mirror is used to then take us 
to the cleansing properties. And so the law of God then sends us to the Messiah, who because of his death doesn't do away with the law, but cleanses us so the dirt is removed and washed away. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So the mud, the dirt, goes down the drain into the sewer, septic line, wherever, gone away. Can you put that dirt back on yourself? Not that dirt. <laughs> Right. Unless you have a septic well in your backyard and you go back in there and you go with all that stuff and, and dig it out, right? And you come out dirtier than you ever were before. Right on the sewer line. No, that's been removed, gone from us. So it doesn't excuse the sin. Doesn't do away with the mirror. Right? The water, the soap doesn't do away with the mirror. Just does away with the curse that the law was upon us. And so the law sends us to the cleansing blood of Messiah to take away our sin. So back to the text, Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So the issue is sin. It's getting rid of sin, not getting rid of law. That's the issue. That's what grace does. Grace doesn't get rid of the law. It doesn't replace the law. It doesn't just forgive the sins, but allow them to remain. No, it gets rid of the sin. So that sin no longer has dominion over us. Grace is, again, just not this wishy-washy forgiveness. Grace is the power of God that gives us dominion over sin. Thus, we are not under the law, but under God's grace. And so shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? No! God forbid, now by the grace of God, we don't have to sin anymore because he has set us free from the power of sin through our death with him in the Messiah and resurrected alive into newness of life. I want to give an illustration. I learned this from a friend of mine, Tony Cerigliano, who's passed away now. Let's say you're in your car and you drive to the bank and you go on a certain road from your house, go out your house, out your garage, out your, down your driveway, down the street, and you go to the, your bank. Okay? And so you enter into the parking lot of your bank and you park in a parking spot and you get out of your car and you walk into the bank and you walk up to the teller and you have filled out a withdrawal slip and you hand them a withdrawal slip and they check it with your bank account and you have enough in there. They take out the amount that you've asked for and they give you that amount and you count it and you take it and then you walk out of the bank. You go back into your car, walk out of the bank, back into your car and you drive on the same road and you drive home, right? Got the picture? Okay, tomorrow, you go back into your home. Tomorrow, you leave your home, go out the garage, down the driveway, down the street, same exact street. Go to the same exact bank. You pull into the same exact parking spot. You walk in through the same exact door. You go up to the same exact teller. And this time you pull out another slip of paper. This time it's not a withdrawal slip. It's a piece of paper that says, give me all your money. I've got a gun. 
and they get you a whole bunch of money and they give it to you and you take the money and you turn to walk out of the bank and a security guard in plain clothing grabs a hold of you and this time instead of walking into your car you walk into the police car instead of going to your house you go to the jailhouse and you are now under the law what was the difference between the two days on the first day you were obedient to the laws on day two you were a lawbreaker, and it's the lawbreakers who become under the law, not the law obeyers. But somehow or another, people have taken it and twisted it upside down and think that those who are obeying the law are under the law. When what Paul was talking about is that those who are breaking the law are under the condemnation of the law. And when we are lawbreakers, the law is very heavy. When we are lawbreakers, the law is burdensome. When we are lawbreakers, the law is there shining in our face, saying you got dirt, mud, poop on your face. It is convicting you and giving you the weight of guilt, and you are under the weight of the law because you are a lawbreaker. So shall we sin? Shall sin have dominion over us? Sin shall not have dominion over you. For we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid! So grace has forgiven us of our past sins, has broken the chain of the carnal nature off of us. Self has been killed with the Messiah. We are now dead in him and alive to God in Messiah, resurrected to newness of life. And so sin has no more power over us because we are living by the grace of God. Living not under some just forgiveness, sins, forgiveness, sins, forgiveness, sin. No, we are living by the power. Grace is the power of God unto salvation. Grace gives us power to keep us from sinning. It removes the sin as far as the east is from the west. Buries it far away from us. Down to the depths of the sea does not remove the law, it removes sin. It removes the power of sin. It removes the habits to sin. It removes the desire and the inclination to sin. Temptation is still there, but gives us power over the temptation. Power to resist the temptation. Power to rebuke the temptation and rebuke the devil. And then to walk in his way. Not un, no longer under the condemnation. We are no longer under the condemnation of the law because our sins have been forgiven and now by God's grace, he is giving us the power to walk rightly as upright citizens walking in his law and in his righteousness. Thus we shall not sin because we're not under the law but under the grace of God. God forbid that we should then sin after that. After all that God has done for us, after Yeshua has given himself, paid his pr our price for us, taken our sins and taken our carnal nature into himself and has broken that bondage off of us and has set us free, God forbid that we should go back to that. God forbid that we should go back to sinning. People interpret this, you're going back to keeping the law? Thus you're putting yourself under the law? No, no. You lawbreaker, you're the one under the law. God forbid that I should go back under the disobedience to the law, under the condemnation of the law. No, 
Now, by God's grace, now that he has set me free, now that he has saved me from my sins, now I walk in his light. Now I walk in his laws. Now they are my delight. What before was a conviction and a burden is now I love. My meditation all day long enlightens me, makes me wiser than my teachers, leads me in the way of everlasting. And happy are those who walk in its way. Is that helpful? Does that make sense? This is the love of God. To obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. They're impossible to do before we have the power of God living in us. Before we have the Holy Spirit living through us. Before we have the grace of God working through this flesh. But once we have experienced his salvation and are born anew and all things have become new, they're no longer burdensome. But they, well, God brings our life in harmony with them, in obedience to them. And then they become easy because his yoke is easy. Not that he threw the cart away, but he carries the yoke. We're walking with him. He's carrying the burden. He's giving us the power. He's walking in us and through us. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua the Messiah. That sound like a God who does away with the commandments? No, ridiculous. But that's what's taught very often around the world. Absolute ridiculous. Twisting of the words of the word of God. No, the saints keep God's commandments by the grace of God and have the faith of Yeshua the Messiah. A perfect blend of both. Can't have one without the other. That is what the grace of God wants to do in us and through us. So, if you have been living under the law, uh, again, I'm not talking about trying to obey the law. I'm talking about trying to obey the law in your own strength. You've been under the law, under the condemnation of the law, under the conviction of the law. The law has been pointing out sin to you. The law is hanging on top of you, arresting you, has you jailed because of the sin that you have committed. And you want to accept the mercy and forgiveness of the Messiah to wash you clean totally clean, and to wash the sin away. Not only the record of the past sin, but the power of the habit, the power of the sinning, and be set free and receive the grace of God so that you rise up above the condemnation and into harmony with it, with God's law. In a moment when we pray, you can confess whatever is still on your record whatever round of sin and confessing and sin and confessing and sin and confessing you've been doing. And finally, accept the grace of God to set you free from sin and death and make you alive unto God. In a moment when we pray, you can do that. Two, if this had made sense and it's answered some questions that you've had, Regarding this, under the law, grace of God. In a moment when we pray, ask God to solidify that in your mind, in your heart. And make it part of your life. It becomes lived out, not just a theology, but lived out in your heart, in mind. Maybe you've heard for a long time the other type of understanding of interpretation. It's going to take more than just hearing it once. You're going to need the miracle of God. You've got to change your thinking in this life. 
And so if that applies to you, then a moment when we pray, let God do his work in transforming the mind, properly understanding the relationship of God's law and his salvation. Three, if you want to walk in the power of God's law, in the power of his grace, if you haven't loved his law, if you don't meditate on his word, if it's not your delight, maybe at one time it was, and now maybe it's just become a rote ceremony you Jews do routinely, and you've lost that first love for God's word, then a moment when we pray, ask God to give you that love for his word. Love for his law. To delight in it. And to walk in it. Cheerfully and happily. If obedience is burdensome, that means you're doing it in your own strength. Stop trying to do it in your own strength. Accept the grace of God to work through you and in you. So if you want to walk in his light by the power of his love, the power of his grace, the power of his Resurrection. And the moment we pray, invite the Holy Spirit to come into your life, to empower you and to live His Word, live His law out of your flesh. If any of those areas apply to you, or maybe something else God spoke to your heart and mind about as we looked at this text and this topic. And let God pray and work in and through you. Let us pray together. Our Lord, our God, our ruler, our king, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us your law. Thank you that it is holy, that it is just, that it is good. Thank you that we can know right from wrong. Thank you that we can walk in your way because you have shown us your path. Thank you for giving us your son. Thank you, Yeshua, for paying the price for our transgression. Thank you for removing the guilt off of us. Thank you for taking the punishment. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for washing it away. Thank you for breaking Satan's hold over us. Breaking the habit of sin. Breaking the carnal nature. And crucifying us with you. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come in us and live in us and through us. Give us a love for your law. Give us a love for your ways. Give us a delight in walking therein. Walk in us and through us. Carry our burden. Carry the weight. Give us your strength. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.